Good morning. Psalm 145, 8 to 9 says, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. He is the Lord that we come as a community to worship today. Come, bless the Lord with me, for the Lord is like a father to his children, and merciful, filled with endless love. He forgives our sins and heals the sickness inside us. He surrounds us with love and mercy and fills our lives with good things. Let's worship God together. Let's all stand. Let us acknowledge our God for who he is through the songs we offer. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough your grace is enough for me great is your love and justice great is your love and justice God of Jacob you use the weak to lead the strong song of your salvation and all your people sing along so remember so remember your people remember your children remember your promise so enough your grace is enough heaven reaches out to us your grace is enough for me God I sing your grace is enough I'm covered in your God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. His love endures forever For the life that's been reborn His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise, Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. 
forever God is faithful. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. Forever. Forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. Are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna.
Only in Jesus who saves are our fears removed, are our broken lives restored, and are we able to experience true peace no matter the circumstance. Let's pass the peace in Jesus' name. Just like Israel that had entered into alliances with others, as God's children, we have an exclusive covenant with him as Israel did in Exodus. And they shall not have no other gods before the Lord. What is idolatry? Idolatry is trusting in created things rather than the creator for our hope and happiness significance, and security. Anything that we place greater value on than God is an idol, and we still find ourselves failing and falling into such as the Israelites did. Let us confess this and ask for the Lord's forgiveness. God, you are a merciful God who is slow to anger. Forgive us for the times we have forgotten and rejected you through our infidelity, our indulgences, our ingratitude, and our ignorance. Do not forget us, God. Do not cast us out of your presence, for you are a faithful God who redeems Israel time and time again. Help us to trust and rest in your unchanging character that the world see and know that you are a God who loves and cares for the poor, the weak, the vulnerable. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Let's take this time to personally pray to our Father for those times that we have rejected him through our infidelity, indulgence, ingratitude, and ignorance. Let's take this time for a silent prayer. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Words of grace from 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We now come to our time of thanksgiving with our giving of tithes through e-transfer and church drop-off, and we give sacrificially as another form of declaring our trust in the Lord the creator, and not trusting in created things. Let us pray and give thanks. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that, you can, that we can always trust in you. You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Please now take it and use it for your kingdom and your glory. Extend and multiple its reach and influence, we pray. May it be a great blessing to many. 
We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. The kids can now go to their respective Sunday school classes as we go through a couple of announcements. So first and foremost, happy Mother's Day. There it is. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms here and online. Uh, the church has a special gift for you at the foyer after the service. So I think you've been handed out the tickets. Uh, you don't have to prove you're a mom. I'm sure they'll give you a gift. Our ladies' lunch also in tea is on Sunday, May 22nd at 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. And it is still open for registration. Okay. So please register today. Uh, the link is on your bulletins and it's also on the screen, tinyurl.com, ICRCT. Okay. And last, we are looking for more volunteers to contribute baked goods or snacks and to help set up the space for our charity bake sale on Sunday, May 29. Okay. The funds raised will go toward people affected and displaced by the Russia-Ukraine war. So please contact Jillian or Isabel if you'd like to participate or help. Okay. And we will now have Yvette uh, come and read our scripture reading from Hosea 3 to 4, followed by Pastor Vic sharing God's message for us today. Today's scripture reading is Hosea chapter 3 and 4. And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. And I said to her, You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man so will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, there is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns and all who dwell in it languish and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Yet let no one contend and let none accuse for with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day, the prophet also shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me, and since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. The more they increase, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priests. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They shall eat but not be satisfied. They shall play the whore but not multiply. Because they have forsaken the Lord to cherish whoredom, wine, and new wine, which take away the understanding. My people inquire of a piece of wood, and their walking staff gives them oracles. For a spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the whore. They sacrifice on the tops of the mountains and burn offerings on the hills, under oak, poplar, and terebinth, because their shade is good. Therefore your daughters play the whore and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they play the whore, nor your brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes, and a people without understanding shall come to ruin. Though you play the whore, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. Enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to Beth-Avon and swear not. 
as the Lord lives. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? Ephraim is joined to idols, leave him alone. When their drink is gone, they give themselves to whoring. The rulers dearly love shame. A wind has wrapped them in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Yvette, for reading for us the scriptures for today. Um, it's so good for, for me to be back here with everyone in person. I actually enjoy, <laughs> praise the Lord. I actually enjoy worshiping in person a lot more than, than you know, online. Uh, it's very weird to see yourself on the video. <laughs> today is Mother's Day, so uh, before we begin with the message, I'd like to take a little time to pray for mothers and for children. Uh, would you stand with me as we pray for mothers and for children? Let's pray. Loving God, on this Mother's Day, we pause to give you thanks for the gifts of mothering. We give thanks for the ways that you are like a mother to us, nurturing us, giving us the guidance and the freedom we need to grow in experience and wisdom, comforting us when we are wounded in body or spirit, believing in and challenging us. For all these things, we offer you praise and our gratitude. On this day, we also give great thanks for our earthly mothers, those who have carried us in their wombs, birthed us with great pain and laboring, fed us with their own bodies. And we give thanks for the mothers who raised us, whether birth mothers, adoptive mothers, or stepmothers, we recognize that motherhood is not just about ties of blood, but also about those who have shown the love of God to us through their care. We give thanks for all the mothers and grandmothers in our midst and all that we have learned from in our interactions with them. On this day, we also bring before you in prayer those for whom Mother's Day is difficult. We remember those who have a difficult or non-existent relationship with their mothers, those whose mothers have passed away, and those who never had the chance to know their mothers. We also remember those who struggle with motherhood, those who find mothering hard, those who wish to be mothers but cannot because of singleness, age, or infertility. We remember those who have given up a child for adoption, and for those who have had miscarriage or lost a child. For all mothers and children who find this day painful, we ask for comfort and peace, that they would know that they are not alone, and that your love surrounds them. God of life, today and every day, we give thanks for the gifts of life and love. Today, today we celebrate with those who have joy on Mother's Day, and we weep with those who find this day difficult. We pray that you teach us on this day what it means to love sacrificially, to show to those around us the kind of love that is willing to pay any price, a mother's love. We ask for these things, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who paid himself the ultimate price for us. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, today's message is titled, Love That Pays the Price. And we'll be focusing most of our attention on Hosea chapter 3, uh, a really short but a powerful chapter to understand what it means uh, to love sacrificially, to have love that pays a price. Hosea chapter 3 opens with these words from the Lord to Hosea. And the first two words are, go again. Hosea is called by the Lord to, to take Hosea as his wife in chapter 1. The Lord says to him, go. And then here in chapter 3, the Lord says, go again. This command actually reminds us of God's faithfulness amidst his calling uh, of people who are called by his name. So for example, in Genesis chapter 12, when God calls Abraham to follow him, God says, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, bless you, make your name great, so that you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and the one who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham goes with this command uh, to go. He, it takes faith uh, to respond to such a command to take actions which are not normally taken. 
For Abraham, he's told to go to a land that God will show him. Now, how many of you would like to be in Abraham's place and tell your wives and your loved ones, God has asked me to go. To where? I'm not sure, but we have to go. I, I don't want to be <laughs> Abraham. I don't want to have that kind of a conversation. It takes great faith. It takes great faith to follow God, to leave the comforts of home, to convince his wife. I mean, Sarah could have said to him, well, how do you know this is God? Right? What if it's not God? If it's God, surely he would know to tell you where to go, for example. Well, Scripture doesn't tell us how exactly that conversation went. All we know is that in faith, Abraham, Sarah, and his whole family, they went as the Lord commanded. Similarly, Hosea's call must have been a difficult one. This call to go again, love a woman who is loved by another man, is an adulteress. It must have been difficult the first time round. I mean, he's a holy man. He's a prophet. He speaks on God's behalf. You know, I mean, in his prayer time with the Lord, perhaps he, he could say, Lord, what would people think? Lord, what would people think when I take this person to be my wife? Surely in the whole village, surely there is one other person who is a bit more suitable. One other person that you have in mind for me, surely this cannot be the case. People know about Goma a lot. People know what she's like. How, how, how will I speak on your behalf? How will I speak to people if they know that I'm engaged to marry someone who is, is a prostitute, someone like that? What will people think? And again, the Bible doesn't tell us how Hosea prayed that day. I believe it must have been difficult. But we know that he went and he did as the Lord instructed, taking Goma daughter of Diblaim, to be his wife. He had three children, Jezreel, Lo Ruhama, and Lo Ami. Jezreel is this fertile valley, he named after a fertile valley, but also a place of bloodshed. Right? So it is, it, this name signifies coming judgment on the nation of Israel. Lo Ruhama, we explained last week, it means no mercy. Lo Ami means not my people. It must have been difficult to give those names. There's so many things that people consider in giving children their names, right? They cannot be named after people we don't like. <laughs> they can't be named after ex-boyfriends and girlfriends, especially not the ones that we did not get married to, right? No, none of those. We, we try to avoid names that are chosen by our good friends, right? Like if we, if we have good friends, they've got kids, and then we, we choose names that are not exactly the same as our good friends' kids' names. I mean, parents these days consult so many resources to name their children, you know. Some, some parents even consult the Bible. So we have Matthew, we have Joshua, we have Caleb, Levi, right? We've got these nice biblical names. But I bet you nobody, nobody on earth would call their children Maher Shalal Hashbash, Isaiah's son. Or in this case, Lo Ruhama, not, no mercy, and Lo Ami, not my people, right? These are just names that we won't give our kids difficult names. So it must have taken faith on Hosea's part to obey God's commands, both in marrying Goma and in naming his children this way. Now I want to explain a little bit about what's going on, just in case we, we have in our minds what, what's going on here. In obeying God, Hosea was engaging in what we call a sign act. Sign acts are actions or objects that are used by prophets so that a message can be effectively communicated to the people in his time of his day. They did not have PowerPoint, they did not have YouTube, they did not have a nice slide, you know, in the background, none of these visual aids. And so a sign act is a very, uh, very visible, very audible way uh, of proclaiming God's message. Now, I don't mean to say that in a sign act, this was a sham marriage. As far as I can see to Hosea, this was a... He was serious about this marriage, even if Goma was not. And this is the sign act. Just as Hosea has married someone who is in adultery or has committed adultery, so God is also in a covenant relationship with Israel that has strayed from him repeatedly. 
That is the sign act, all right? One party would remain for faithful in the covenant, in the covenant relationship, but the other party will be faithless and unfaithful. So when Israel looks at Hosea, instead of judging him for what he has done for being married to Gomer, they would be reminded, actually, of their own unfaithfulness and their own faithlessness before God, you see. So that is the, the sign act. That's what's happening. They will be reminded of their infidelity, their indulgence, ingratitude, and ignorance. Now, in the first verse of Hosea 3, the prophets told, Go again, love a woman. This confirms what we already know of the sign act. It is a reminder to Israel of Israel's unfaithfulness. And this, but this verse actually comforts us. Because the Lord declares His continued love for us as the Lord loves. As the Lord loves. Even though the children of God have chased after other gods, have gone after them in idolatry and infidelity towards God, God continues to love His children. That should comfort us. Distance but something has happened between verse 1 and verse 2. Why go again? Where is he to go? Something has happened. Distance has cropped up between verse 1 and verse 2, between Hosea and Gomer. There's some distance between them and he now has to go again. He has to bridge some gap, some distance. Where is he to go? Where has Gomer gone? Well, She's not at home. She's not in the home that they've made together. Not in the normal place that she would be expected to be, married to Hosea. And so Hosea goes and looks for her. In between verse 1 and 2, he looks for her. I imagine he goes to the places that he thinks that she would go. So maybe he goes to her parents' place. Doesn't find her there. And he looks elsewhere. Not finding her, maybe he goes to that part of town a part of town that she used to work in, the seedier side of town, if you know what I mean. This holy man of God has to go to this part of town to look for his wife and to ask people that he meets, have you seen my wife? Have you seen my wife? Maybe he asks those who work in the area, people who used to know Gomer, who used to work alongside her, have you seen my wife, Gomer? Oh, oh, I haven't seen her. I, I thought the both of you were married. I, I, I thought, you know, this, this, this had been left behind. Oh, no, I, I haven't seen her in a couple of days. Um, just looking for her. Oh, good luck. Hope you find her. Maybe he asks a guy that he meets, have you, ha have you seen Gomer? Have you seen my Gomer? Hoping the answer is no, but then also conflicted, hoping that someone has indeed seen his wife Gomer. And after a while, someone says yes. Someone says, yes, I saw her. I saw her at the auction block. She's run up a pile of debts. She's lived beyond her means. She's spent more than she, she has earned. And the person who was living with her didn't want to pay her debts. So she's put herself up for sale. I saw her at the auction block. So Hosea goes to the auction block. That's in verse 2. And he pays the price for her freedom. It says, 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. Now, a lethek is half a homer. Uh, a homer is about 200 and 220 liters uh, worth. So that's about 331 liter bottles of barley. Okay, Sch scholars tell us that this would be worth about 15 shekels. And so Hosea actually pays 30 shekels, 30 pieces of silver to redeem Gomer, his wife. He pays for what is already in what is already his in name. He pays. He pays in order that she might belong to him in reality. He pays the price. In name. Hosea and Gomer are married, husband and wife. But in reality, Gomer has stepped out and lived 
with another man. But that man did not wish to pay for her to maintain her freedom. And Hosea redeems her. She sold herself into slavery for debts that she had racked up. And Hosea redeems her. Hosea, whose name means salvation, he steps in. He pays the price for her freedom, the price she could not pay. He pays for what is his already in name in order that she might belong to him. In reality, he pays. So Hosea is the man from God. Salvation is his name. He steps into the seedy side. He pays the price to set his beloved free, free from imposed, self-imposed slavery. He pays for what is already his and he demonstrates love in doing that, demonstrates love that is willing to pay the price. Thanks be to God. Doesn't that remind you of someone else we know in the Bible? Someone else who stepped into the seedy side of this earth and paid the price. But as for Gomer, she is to maintain a time of abstinence. So in verse 3, she is not to engage in prostitution, nor to belong to another man. She is to abstain from that which had caused her to become corrupted in the first place. And as part of her redemption for a time, she is to undergo a period of moral purification. So that's what we see in verse 3. And just as the marriage was a sign act, this, this abstinence is also a sign act for those in Israel for a period. The institutions in Israel which had become corrupted would no longer be present Israel would be without king, priest, and prophet. These are the institutions that were given as good, but they, become, they had become corrupted as Israel chased after false idols. They went after these false gods in infidelity, ignorance, indulgence, and uh, ingratitude. This actually comes to pass. The northern kingdom of Israel would be invaded by Assyria about 30 or 40 years from this time that Hosea makes this prophecy. And indeed, in that day, the northern kingdom loses everything. It, will no, it no longer has kings, priests, or prophets. And even though, although right now, the nation of Israel has been reconstituted in modern times, we look forward to the latter days, to a time when all of Israel will seek the Lord recognize the Messiah who paid for them the ultimate price. But as yet, the majority have yet to know. I said last week that the main charge that Hosea brings regarding Israel's ignorance, the main charge is ignorance, right? And we see that in verses 1 and 6 of Hosea chapter 4. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This word da'at, um, is, is, is the word for knowledge and it's linked to the word for know, to know God, yada, which we highlighted last week. So the main charge of ignorance is that they do not know God, they do not yada God, they have no knowledge of God, no yada of God. Sometimes this verse has been misused, verse 6. People say, oh, for the, you know, they say, oh, we should pursue knowledge. Uh, chapter 4, verse 6. We should pursue knowledge. And my answer to that is both yes and no. We are to pursue knowledge, but knowledge of a certain kind. In the context of the book of Isaiah, ignorance is the problem, but it's ignorance of a certain kind. We need to pursue knowledge, not knowledge in general. Specifically, we are to pursue the knowledge of God. There's no faithfulness or steadfast love, no knowledge of God in the land. That's what for chapter 4, verse 1 says. So Hosea is calling for pursuit of a certain kind of knowledge in a certain kind of way as well. It's not just knowing about God. It's not just cataloging God's characteristics and His traits, who, you know, reading the Bible and saying, oh, oh, you know, who is God only? But it's also to know God in relationship. That's why there's this need for faithfulness. That's why there's this need for steadfast love. It's not just head knowledge. Our knowledge of God has to go from our head. It has to filter into our hearts. It has to convict us from the inside out. Oh, this is who God is. Oh, this is who God is. Let me respond to Him. It's both knowledge that there's 
of the head, but it has to move to the heart. So he's calling for knowledge of a relational kind. That's the difference between knowing about God and knowing God. Now, if you've dated someone or if you've become married, you'll know exactly what I mean. You go from knowing about a person, their names, what they look like, what they're interested in. You go from knowing about a person to knowing that person relationally. To see them in good times and in bad times, in sickness and in health, in the highs and lows, in every season of life. And this kind of knowledge is different from what you could find out from dating apps or Google, Facebook, Instagram or LinkedIn. Right? So the reason why ignorance is the main problem is that when people don't know who God is, relationally they will want to put something or someone in God's place. It's, it's very natural. We humans are created with a void in our hearts that only God can fill. And until and unless we find Him, we try to fill that void with everything else. Relationships and friendships. Until we realize that people are failed and flawed too. We are failed and flawed. And, and while friendships are good and important, they cannot take the place of friendship with God. If we put the, that in the middle, we're going to be disappointed. You know, or sometimes we try to fill that void with materialistic things. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, right? Indulging in all the pleasures that today can offer, focusing on immediate self-gratification as much as possible all the time. Let's run out the clock until death calls time on us. But as many have found out, the satisfaction that we gain from this kind of indulgence is fleeting. Yes, there's some satisfaction, but it's fleeting. It doesn't fill forever. We, it always leaves us wanting something more. Because there is, my friends, a God-shaped, God-sized void in our hearts that only God can fill. Nothing else. No matter how much we try, no matter how much we place people and things in the center of our lives, that will not give us what we truly need. That is why ignorance is the main charge. It is out of ignorance that people drift from God in infidelity, seek to enjoy their short lives in indulgence, refuse to acknowledge God as the giver of all good gifts in ingratitude. Ignorance is the real problem. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, God declares, knowledge of himself. And just so you, you, you don't go away thinking that God is pleased by this or God is somehow you know, happy that his people are going to be destroyed, I want you to pay attention to the words, my people. My people. I always pay attention to the word my because it signifies God's relationship, ongoing kinship with his people. Even if they're going to disappoint him, even if they have strayed from him, even if for 300 years they've chosen to go their own way, God continues to call them my people. He will still be faithful to them in covenant. He still calls them my people. Can you hear the concern of the voice of the Lord? Can you hear how he's concerned for his people? These are not the words of one who cannot be bothered. These are the very words of one who cares. He cares very much. He cares enough that he will bring them back to himself. He cares enough to remain faithful to a covenant that he has made with them. Now we know that in the covenant, as we mentioned last week, there are blessings for obedience and there are curses for disobedience. The judgment that Israel receives is a reminder to those who forgot. But God is still faithful to the covenant and they need to return from their unfaithfulness. This judgment is self-inflicted. Just as Gomer has sold herself into slavery to pay for a life she could not afford to live, so also the judgment that is to befall Israel is self-inflicted. But as we have seen in chapters 1 and 2 so far, there will be judgment, but judgment is not the final word. There will be judgment, I say it again, but judgment is not the final word. And that's the pattern of the book of Hosea, if you go through it. Hosea chapter 1 says, it ends with, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, cannot be measured or numbered. In a place that it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall, be, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. 
Children of, Is of Judah and of Israel shall be gathered together. They shall appoint for themselves one head. They shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Israel. And in chapter 2, as we discussed last week, there, there are two therefores in chapter 2 which speak of the judgment of God. But in the third therefore, the third therefore is not that of judgment. The third therefore is the Lord promising that He will chase after Israel. He will allure them. He will draw near to Israel once again and not to chastise them but to cherish them. In that day, He will have mercy on the one who is called no mercy and He will say, to my people, to those who are not called, to those who are called not my people, he will say, my people. You see, Israel re represents all of us, represents humanity. We, we might say, oh yeah, but today we don't worship idols. But I'll say to you, there might be things that you've placed in the center, things or people. Things of people that have taken the place of God. Yes, you might not worship idols made of metal, stone and wood. But surely, whenever we forget God, whenever we put aside the knowledge of God, surely we put something else in the center. And surely Israel represents all of humanity. We need to see God clearly. We need to know Him and to know Him relationally. And we need to know actually who God is. Who God is. You see, a right understanding of Hosea is this, that God loves deeply. For Him, it is still my people who are destroyed for lack of knowledge. God cares deeply. Where there is judgment, it is not the final word. Hosea, salvation, that is the final word. By the way, Gomer means to be completed or to be fulfilled. So when Gomer and Hosea are finally brought together once again by the grace of God, salvation is complete. Salvation is fulfilled. That's what it means. Hosea himself, this person imperfect as he stands, points to someone who is to come. Someone whose name, Yeshua, also means salvation, who did not belong here but decided to come down from heaven, from perfection, to this side of town, to the messy side. Someone who would declare the love of God to the whole world, someone who would be willing to pay a price to set his beloved free, free from self-imposed slavery of sin, to pay for what was already his, to pay the ultimate price his life for mine, His life for yours, His life for the life of the world. Freely given but so costly to Him to demonstrate love that pays the ultimate price. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. With this in mind, at the end of chapter 3, Hosea invites the people of God to do three things to return, to reach out, and to revere. I've made them start with R so that we can remember. If you're feeling distant from God, return. Turn back to Him. If you've put something else in the center, turn away from that thing. Put God in the center. You might be chasing for something that does not give you satisfaction in the long run. Return. Return to God. Seek Him. Reach out to Him. Instead of turning to people and things that will not fully satisfy, reach out to Him. Seek Him. We've been created with a God-shaped, God-sized void in our hearts that only God can fill. Reach out to Him and revere Him. The word here is pachad. And this is one of those words which have quite a number of meanings. So it's translated here in the, in the ESV as fear. But because it is connected with the goodness of the Lord, this word can also mean to revere Him, to worship Him only, to let other things remain as they are, as they ought to be on the periphery, and to allow God to take center stage, to allow God to take that right place right there in the center of it all. We need to return, we need to reach out, 
and we need to reveal the Lord, our God. Let's worship him and raise to him the praise and the worship that's due his name. Let's all stand. cry out to worship whose glory taught the stars to shine perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing but this joy is mine with a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. would die for our redemption whose resurrection means our rise there isn't time enough to sing of all you've done but I have eternity to try with a thousand with a thousand hallelujahs we magnify your name you alone deserve the glory the honor and the praise lord jesus this song is forever yours a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more with a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs, a thousand more. We 
magnify your name you alone deserve the glory the honor and the praise lord jesus this song is forever yours a thousand hallelujahs a thousand more receive now this benediction as we move from here the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance that you might know him and the depth and the breadth, the length and the height of his love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The service is now over, but we invite you to sit with us for a short time of reflection before we move off from here. Thank you.